good afternoon and good evening every everywhere you are watching us from on behalf of the nepal institute for international cooperation and engagement and the water policy center it gives me a great pleasure to extend a warm welcome to our distinguished speaker chair and participant who registered for this event this is the eighth section of the conference to chair and moderate this section it's a really pleasure to have you dr saraswati unni ma'am here with us dr saraswati unni is a senior research fellow and program director at the water policy center in aurangabad she is researching and mobilizing research on water food energy next she had been associate professor and head department of political science in nsc ratnam college in mumbai professor unni has engaged in teaching and research having for more than 35 years in this field dr saraswati has been awarded a phd from the university of mumbai for her research on energy apart from this she has presented papers in several national and international conference in usa uk china spain australia canada and portugal she has also published many research papers national and international in journals and books she writes on gender energy governance and development issues without any further ado let me now dr saraswati unni mm -hmm. to moderate the section Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, can you hear me now? I'm audible. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Yes, so, uh, do we have uh, Sweya Sangrola here? Yes. She's present. Right here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So uh, let's begin with uh, uh, Sweya, who is assistant professor at the Kathmandu School of Law, Urvanchi University, Nepal. Uh, she will be speaking on human rights, audit of pharmaceutical companies and health sector during covid-19 crisis so over to you sweya you will have about 20 minutes for every presentation after which if we have time we'll go for the question and answer session okay so sweya yes uh, namaste good evening uh, thank you dr unni for your uh, for handing over the podium to me a virtual podium to discuss some of the most important issues uh, uh, facing the world and humanity today uh, so i have 20 minutes but i would love i would like to take about uh, 10 to 15 minutes so we have more time for the presentation uh, my name is swachha sangrola as uh, the chair mentioned i'm an assistant professor of uh, law at uh, kathmandu school of law purvanchal university Um, I am a young teaching. I, I've just joined the teaching faculty, so it hasn't been a lot of years. But a few years, I completed my uh, masters from Harvard Law School, where I focused on global governance, uh, international institutional, organization law, and in general legal theory and philosophy. Uh, I must admit, at the very outset, that I have very little direct exposure working with the public health sector, and I've been. invited to speak on pharmaceutical companies and and auditing through human rights approaches so i must admit my weakness uh, about my very limited exposure to the public health aspect and uh, ha on hand uh, experience with pharmaceutical companies however i am in a position where i am able to observe if there is a divorce between public health and human rights and and law uh, and this was the case when in 2000 when i was in law school i signed up for a save the children uh, uh, project which was about whether mothers in rural parts of nepal are taking care of themselves and are taking adequate precautions in maintaining their nutrition and reproductive rights and health so i was a young student i really didn't know much about what i was doing i had a list of questions and a, and a questionnaire that i was supposed to fill I went and talked to some uh, women from rural parts of Nepal, and I asked a question, and I was surprised by their response. They said uh, that they had been going to hospitals for delivering children, um, and the maternal mortality rate in Nepal had gone down significantly for the for the past few from the past few years. And I was amazed 
by this accomplishment. So I, I, after, after my research was over, I dug deeper and started having a conversation with her. And I said, wow, the data is really nice. You're going to the hospital. So what is the reason behind this? So the context is public health wise, indicator wise, it was a big success that we were getting women from Nepal to go to the hospitals to deliver uh, their babies. Great. But I was also a student of human rights. So I started talking to them about the motivations and uh, number one was the government incentive that they were getting paid to go and have their babies delivered in hospitals. I dug deeper and then the real reason came out and, the re and she said that a lot of public health experts, um, I wouldn't wanna name organizations, but they had convinced women from rural Nepal to go deliver their babies in hospital because they said, if you don't go and deliver your baby in the hospital, your husband is going to leave you because uh, he is going to have another wife because there are certain facilities in the hospital, uh, such as operations and stitching. If you don't get that done, your husband will bring you another, another uh, uh, he'll, will bring another wife. So I, and that seemed to be a very big psychological reason for why women, and, and that got me thinking as a young student, I, I, got, I, I thought, wow, the results are really good. But, but process-wise, what, what motivations and what kind of logic are we using for women in general to take advantage of health? Same was the case uh, during the Ebola in Africa. I heard a podcast where someone mentioned that one reason they were so successful uh, in, in, in eradicating Ebola in some villages were villages were simply told that people with Ebola uh, had some kind of a disease that was given by the gods. So if you went closer to that person, you would get it. So logic wise, people didn't go close to that person. But in terms of human rights and, and motivations, that got me thinking about the importance of auditing the process. Uh, there is a logic, uh, a very Machiavellian logic about uh, the end justifies the means or all is well that ends well. So that got me interested in the process of in rethinking the process with, with which we reach an outcome. And in the, in the, in the post-COVID scenario, I'm not sure if we're in that, in that situation yet or if uh, we will even ever reach the new normal because I see a possibility where a lot of inherited biases and schemas from uh, international order from the days will still come in this new situation. So it, I don't think it will be a new normal because I think pharmaceutical companies and, and stakeholders will continue working in the same fashion uh, under a different circumstance that is the COVID. Now, in particular, in, to, in today in the next 10 minutes, I, I want to address the process of developing drugs and testing the COVID drug. Uh, I, I think we had a panelist who was going to talk about vaccine diplomacy. I would love to hear from her. Uh, but I would focus more on the experimentation and the ethics and human rights behind developing the COVID uh, drug. Uh, I dug deeper and I was surprised by the amount of literature that was available on the ethics of experimentation on human, in, in human beings. Um, there's a lot of good stuff. You have to get informed consent. You have to make sure they know about the risks and benefits of test being tested with a vaccine. So lots of good stuff. Everything looks good so far. On paper, it looks great. So then I put it in context. Nepal, I am from Nepal. Nepal has just accepted, uh, the Ministry of Health has given permission to the Chinese company Hongxi and uh, Russian vaccine and Oxford University's vaccine to be tested in Nepal. This is the phase three of testing. Then a bunch of questions emerged about some analogy could be done, could be drawn between the multi the way multinational companies work and the way pharmace global pharmaceutical companies, whether government funded or private institutions, work. Uh, do not get me wrong; I have a lot of respect for a lot of uh, activities being done and research being done by pharmaceutical companies and governments. Right to health is enshrined in international documents, the International Covenant on Social Economic uh, uh, Rights talks about the right to have, to have the highest attainable standard of health and states have every duty to make sure they prevent epidemics. Um, but still there is some kind of a similarity between 
a multinational company that goes to Vietnam and gets cheap labor to make a branded shoe, which they themselves cannot later afford to buy. So they will, and pharmaceutical companies doing different kinds of studies of drugs. Now we don't know what the situation is going to be like in the COVID scenario, but I can draw from the AIDS uh, testing, vaccine te testing procedures and others. And there was a brilliant book written by Ben Goldacker who teaches at the London School of Hygiene called Big Pharma, Bad Pharma, uh, pardon me. And there were some very surprising results about how there is this outsourcing of testing to poorer countries and developing countries was very much similar to the way the multinational corporations outsource uh, production and manufacturing to the poorer parts of the country. And imagine a, a Nike shoe and a, a, a drug that saves lives. They are, very, they are very similar in the way they operate. In terms of soft laws, there are the Helsinki Declaration on the ethics of human experimentation, blah, blah, blah. But in, in, in case of AIDS, for example, when the, when the drug was tested in the population of Africa, later on when the drug was developed, the African populations on whom the HIV drug was tested, they themselves were not able to afford the drug. And this was after the Helsinki Declaration came into practice, which said that pharmaceutical companies and anyone who is testing the drug have a basic minimum ethical obligation to make sure that when they are choosing a sample population to test their drugs, you have to make sure they will be able to afford it. And despite that in practice, uh, for example, um, there, there have been a lot of cases, I don't want to bore you with the nitty gritties of the law, but simply put, global pharmaceutical companies, especially from big countries, are able to outsource their testing because it is definitely cheaper for them to test their drugs in poorer parts of the world. Uh, if you wonder why is that, there might definitely good intentions. Like we, I just heard that polio has been completely eradicated from the face of the earth. There's a lot of good intention and effort behind that. I am all for international solidarity, but I feel as a student of law and philosophy, questioning the dominant narratives, everyone wants a drug, we must be happy and we must accept it. But this is especially for the developing countries. How do you assess the risk and the benefit of allowing big countries to come to your country and letting your population be tested? So how, where do you draw that line? Because Tomorrow, whether if there is an injury, the compensation will be determined according to the national law, that is the country in which the drug is being tested. One reason why multinational companies go, go to poorer countries is because poorer countries have lax labor standards. So they take advantage of the weak laws on labor and compensation and working standards. So in case there is a damage, and if in case there is a case, they won't be they, they won't have to pay as much fine as they would have to pay in the United States of America. If if you if a testing goes horribly wrong in the UK or in the US, you can imagine the amount of legal liabilities that the companies would have to would have in their own country. And one reason I found the similarity that in developing countries, because our laws about compensation and drug testing are not as strict as most developed countries, that is one reason why there is so much charm for having, uh, for testing this, uh, these drugs. So this seems like a bad scenario. However, there are some very good points. Uh, the government of Nepal, for example, has a very strong Nepal Health Research Council and Ethical Committee Board that talks about all of these things, but it hasn't been able to pronounce, uh, make pronouncements on, for example, if the drug does get accepted and the drug does come out, what benefits will the population of Nepal get out of it? Will they even be able to afford it? So these are the things they have to work out because on paper, everything looks great and nice. But in reality, there's a, there is a lot that needs to be done. That said, uh, as a concluding point, I will still say that human beings are different because they have a zeal and a knack for exploration and innovation. When, the, when there is a space launch, whether it's from India or Russia or United States, I, I, am, 
I am very excited because it, it unites me with the rest of the world. It doesn't matter if the, if the vessel, if the, uh, the rocket that is being launched is from the territory of Nepal, because that then I am my macro identity as a human being helps me. And in that regard, I think I, I, we must welcome China, UK and Russia uh, for, for showing an interest in testing the COVID vaccine in Nepal. However, I, I am also scared that uh, the lessons from the past may be forgotten in the new normal. Uh, because it's a new normal, we, we cannot forget uh, what has happened before. Uh, with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. If there are more questions, we can go for a discussion. Thank you. Well, I think uh, we'll go for the questions in the end yeah. after all the presentations. Sure. Uh, is there anybody who, here who would like to ask questions? Because we have to prime actually. Uh, is there anyone? Okay. So uh, can I uh, ask you one question? Sure. Yes. yes. So uh, this would be about the. Can you tell us specifically about um, any particular vaccine that is uh, being tested right now? COVID vaccine in Nepal. Do are you aware of any uh, Chinese or Russian companies yes. that have approached the Nepalese population, yes, or the people, the government of Nepal, regarding yes. testing any specific vaccine. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, that's a good question. So it was on the twenty fourth of August. I heard uh, a news that the Ministry of Health uh, has accepted, has given permission to three stakeholders to go on with the phase three of the vaccine. So what the next step, uh, I, I do not think they are testing as of now, but they, they have started the process and uh, they will soon allow the Oxford University vaccine and the Russian vaccine and, uh, and Chinese vaccine to be tested for phase three in Nepal. And the next step is that the Nepal Health Research Council, which is the body that looks at the ethical implication of health research, will, uh, will uh, look at different requirements, whether they are going to meet the requirements within the national law of Nepal. And, and, then, and the law itself is, uh, is, is pretty good. It, it has a lot of good standards from international um, instruments as well. So we are in the process. Uh, we don't have a lot of information. Unfortunately, that is uh, a problem in, in most parts of the world where you, have, you can go to the website and you will see official press releases, but a lot of the nitty gritty is about what kind of requirements these companies have to meet before getting permission those aren't part of the public domain and unfortunately that is a big problem so that is the only thing that is in the domain and that's uh, all i know about yeah so now are there uh, advocacy groups that can help in nepal are there enough advocacy groups that can help to ensure transparency and affordability in particular uh, yes, uh, the, the consumer protection groups in Nepal are uh, very strong. We recently had a case three years back uh, regarding the expend very expensive medicines. And this case, this, this NGO took up a case about expensive medicines and went to the Supreme Court of Nepal. And the Supreme Court of Nepal very strongly said, if you make uh, ex medicines expensive, that is as good as denying the right to health of a citizen under fundamental right. So these are very strong judgments. And I am hoping that the judiciary is taking note of what is happening. A lot of the things are not in public domain. So I would probably not be not best place to give the details, but uh, I will definitely be looking out for uh, these details as much as I can and hopefully have another platform where we can talk about this more. That's a very interesting outlook and a presentation there. Thank you so much, uh, Swetia. Yes. Can we now move on to Dr. Anna? Is Dr. Anna present? Dr. Anna Velikaya? Yeah. Hello, dear colleagues. Can you hear me? We can. So, uh, Dr. Anna Velikaya from Russia. She's going to speak on uh, Russian humanitarian diplomacy during the COVID-19 pandemic, foreign policy, and these diplomacy goals. So over to you, uh, Dr. Anna Velikaya. 
Yes, thanks a lot, Dr. Namaskara. Dobry den. Hello, I'm Anna Velika from Institute of World Economy and International Relations, Russian Academy of Sciences. Uh, I'd like to thank Nepal Institute of International Cooperation and Engagement and Water Policy Center for this opportunity to present my paper on Russian humanitarian diplomacy during the COVID pandemic, foreign policy and public diplomacy goals. Uh, the provision of humanitarian assistance to foreign countries is an essential part of humanitarian policy, also including strengthening public administration, building infrastructure, maintaining security and stability, ensuring the educational process, developing healthcare and fostering economic growth. The countries providing humanitarian aid brand themselves as leaders in the field of education, science, economy, demonstrating the attractiveness of the chosen model of state system. Countries are taking these steps not only for the sake of humane motives of providing assistance to those in need, but also for national branding in priority regions. It's also aimed at fulfilling foreign political and economic tasks, increasing loyalty of citizens of recipient states. Countries providing humanitarian assistance during the pandemic demonstrate successful economic models, advanced science and effective policy. Since activities in the humanitarian field are related to foreign policy tasks, most of the efforts in this sphere are carried out by governmental and semi-governmental institutions, although in the, with the involvement of civil society. At the same time, this tool is not a panacea as it brings results on the, in the long run and only in combination with attractive domestic and foreign policies. Although it may seem the process of providing humanitarian assistance is standardized, in the reality the programs are adjusted to local conditions. Each country has special regulations, different aspects of working with government bodies, specific conditions for the activities of foreign organizations. It's based on needs assessments, on the requests of an external audience, and creating solutions that meet them. Soviet scientists successfully participated in solving problems of global importance, including the creation of polio and smallpox vaccines, the development of the foundations of radiobiology, the study of radiation sickness and methods of its treatment, and space physiology. Since the end of the Cold War until early 2000s, Russian humanitarian aid programs were substantially cut. It was a unilateral disarmament in this sphere. The necessity for using it more actively was realized in Russia 20 years ago. That is the reason why all mechanisms of its participation in the engagement with foreign audiences and international development assistance have only recently been re-established. Both Russia and post-Soviet countries have a unique approach towards humanitarian cooperation. It's seen as being broader than international development assistance and international aid or even broader than public diplomacy. Currently, Russia spends about $1 billion annually under an open budget line on projects in the field of international development assistance. But these funds go through the UN structures, and their recipients often do not realize that it is provided by Russian taxpayers. It's planned to direct it as the bilateral aid to regions that are strategically important for Russia, link them with current humanitarian aid, and receive long-term reputational dividends to achieve a positive or neutral attitude towards Russia from the target audience. This realization is what led to the adoption of the concept of the Russian state policy in the sphere of international development assistance. It has moved its priorities from international institutions to a more regional direction. Russia has started pursuing an active and targeted policy in the field of international development assistance. In this regard, it has signed a landmark partnership framework agreement with UNDP, creating the Russia UNDP Trust Fund. So its aid is now more regional oriented and target focused. Unfortunately, Russian civil society is not widely involved in public diplomacy and humanitarian aid agenda. There are various reasons for this, from the administrative barriers to the misunderstanding of businesses on the importance of national branding. We are also witnessing the lack of actors, especially of independent ones. And as for the COVID situation, Russia has provided assistance in the fight against coronavirus to almost 50 countries, mainly through bilateral channels. According to the Humanitarian Monitor Project, the top priority were post-Soviet and Eurasian states, more than 50% of aid. Also, it was Europe, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Italy and Serbia, Middle East and North Africa, Algeria, Iran, Lebanon and Syria, Afghanistan, USA, South and Central America, Caribbean, Brazil, Venezuela, 
Guatemala, Dominican Republic, Costa Rica, Cuba, Nicaragua, Panama, El Salvador, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar, Sub-Saharan Africa, Guinea, Congo, Djibouti, Namibia, Senegal, South Africa, and Sierra Leone, Oceania, Nauru. It corresponds with regional priorities of Russian public diplomacy and humanitarian cooperation that may be divided into two groups. The first one is Russia's top priority, post-Soviet Eurasian countries. The second one is other countries that are in need of foreign aid or are considered as difficult partners, like the USA, or those that are interested in dialogue. Russian activities in this field are global and include assistance to the sub-Saharan countries of Africa, developed in countries of Asia-Pacific integration structures and fostering cooperation with the Middle East, North Africa, and Latin America. In addition to bilateral assistance, Russia has allocated additional funds to counter the coronavirus through multilateral channels in the form of financial contributions to Russia UNDP Trust Fund, to International Red Cross Committee, and to the World Health Organization. Provided humanitarian aid was in the form of test systems of medical equipment, medicines, food, and financial resources. Medical personnel was sent to 11 countries. Mostly widely covered in media were Russian Ministry of Defense missions to Italy and Serbia. Even the terms mask diplomacy and coronavirus diplomacy were coined. Although I suppose that if everything is diplomacy, then nothing is diplomacy, so we should be careful about creating and coining new diplomacies. Russian institutions providing humanitarian aid may be divided into two groups. The main part of supplies went through the government of the Russian Federation, through the Ministry of Health, Rospotrebnadzor, and the Federal Medical or Biological Agency. The second group includes non-governmental and commercial organizations like Russia Direct Investment Fund, Rosatom State Corporations, Russian Orthodox Church, sub-state diplomacy initiatives, for example, Russian ethnic Turkic regions were providing aid to Central Asian states. Also, Russian NGOs were participating in providing humanitarian assistance, and also these were private humanitarian initiatives of Russian diplomats. Since the beginning of the pandemic, Russia has actively provided other states with a variety of assistance. Like other donor states, over the past six months, Russia has directed humanitarian efforts to counter the spread of the infection. Russia has created world's first coronavirus vaccine. More than 20 countries have made requests to purchase over $1 billion of Russia's Sputnik V coronavirus vaccine, including Brazil, Kazakhstan, India, Mexico, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates. So we can assume that uh, Russian humanitarian cooperation is aimed to support other countries and regions while creating an attractive image of their own country. And uh, I was glad to hear from the previous speaker that currently there is project in Nepal of, of, with testing this vaccine. And uh, in the conclusion, I'd like to say that cooperation between states in the field of country in the pandemic at the diplomatic and intergovernmental level continues. But at the same time, we, should, uh, we are witnessing that the motives of national egoism still prevail. And meanwhile, in times of pandemic, humanitarian aid is becoming a more needed instrument capable of laying the ground for international cooperation and promoting an international agenda while branding the country as leader in technology, the economy, and knowledge. Humanitarian diplomacy initiatives interconnected with public diplomacy can be very timely to resolve global threats. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Velikaya. You can hear me now. Thank you. Yes, yes thank you. Uh, I just uh, want to throw it open for questions. Is there anyone who would like to ask questions? Because we do have time. I guess we have. Okay, so uh, I guess there's no one who wants to ask the questions. So may I? I wanted to ask you specifically uh, whether you know anything about the Russian vaccine and uh, when is it likely to be released if uh, that is not possible? Uh, uh, are they likely to share this vaccine with other countries? Um, yes, I suppose that uh, it would be given uh, in the form uh, of uh, commercial deals, like already we have contracts with 20 countries, and uh, 
possibly it would be given uh, as humanitarian aid, but uh, as for now, I haven't seen uh, such information because uh, for sure we have our own population that is in need of this vaccine and there are millions uh, of people desperately needing it. So I suppose that for sure it would be on commercial ground, but maybe it would be also given to some partner states of top priority. So it would be a very important uh, diplomatic question uh, how it would be shared uh, with our partners. Yeah, is there uh, anyone who would like to ask questions or we can uh, move on to the next person? Okay, so then can I thank you very much, Dr. Veli. Thank you. Uh, we could be asking you questions later if we have time. Is that okay? Yeah. So can we have uh, Sushmita Das? Is she available? She is not there. She's, she's she's not. Not. Okay, and then Dr. Sonali Singh? Yeah, she is there. Dr. Sonali Singh? Please unmute yourself, please. Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Okay, so Dr. Sonali Singh from Jayaprakash University, India, will speak on vaccine diplomacy, who gets it, when and how. So over to you, Dr. Sonali Singh. Thank you, uh, respected chair and all the honored participants uh, attending this uh, webinar. Greetings from Bihar, India. I would like to start with thank you for having me into this conversation. And uh, it's really uh, a joyful and honor for me. If anything that kills over 10 million people in the next few decades, it is most likely be a contagious virus and not a war. This was the line said by Bill Gates in his tech talk in 2015. My topic for today's presentation is on vaccine diplomacy and the blurb followed who gets how and when is just to indicate the power dynamics involved in uh, this vaccine formation and distribution. So coming back to what uh, Bill Gates has warned us uh, five years back, he clearly said that we are not ready, we are not prepared for any epidemic. And here we are after five years. And uh, we have uh, 24 million people infected worldwide uh, because of this coronavirus and 822,000 people are diseased. And literally the whole uh, economy uh, disrupted because of this pandemic. Yes, we were not prepared. When the WHO announced on 30th of January that uh, this uh, coronavirus pandemic is a global health crisis, since then it is uh, more than uh, 210 days and each day remained uh, painful for us to see in the news what is happening around us in every part of the world. So what is the solution? And everyone is hoping for, you know, a vaccine. And uh, nowadays we all are uh, in, uh, we all are into this question, when will the vaccine be ready? But I believe that the more important question or the more pressing question is, when the vaccine will be ready, how will it be distributed or used? are purchased for um, you know, 7.8 billion population. Here comes the role of vaccine diplomacy. So vaccine diplomacy is a part of global health diplomacy that uh, relies on use and delivery of vaccines for foreign policy advantage. And we have seen in the past how vaccines have been used as a tool to uh, peace building or as a tool to uh, mitigate conflict resolution. Uh, the classic example from Cold War could be uh, in the 1950s when Albert Bruce Sabin uh, collaborate, uh, collaborated with Soviet virologists uh, to you know, test and uh, uh, license uh, polio vaccine and he got succeeded, his team got succeeded uh, by the end of 1950s. And at that time, 10 million Soviet children received that vaccine that was a collaborative effort of uh, Soviet and US virologists. And for that, Soviet government uh, later on um, honored 
uh, Sabin by the highest civilian medal. And uh, uh, another example that we can take, the US administration learned from this bilateral uh, success of diplomacy. And what it did later on was uh, sent 35 million medical supplies to Cuba uh, in assurance of exchange of 1,700 uh, prisoners uh, from the Fidel Castro administration. And we have uh, one more example, classic example, if you go a little back in early 1800, when Edward Jenner, uh, who uh, British uh, inventor of smallpox vaccine, got appointed as a, a foreign member of uh, France Institute or Institute of France. And he was also called by uh, both the governments to mitigate a prisoner's exchange. So, um, and there was a famous uh, line by Edward Jenner, the signs never go, uh, goes into war. So learning from all those past experiences, what do we have now uh, for the uh, present crisis uh, to deal with? Can we use that bilateral uh, you know, uh, diplomacy to uh, establish peace or maybe to resolve conflict. For that, we need to understand the nature of current pandemic or the crisis. The current coronavirus pandemic is unique in nature. It is unique because of uh, the size of shock uh, people have. It is unique because of the size of population affected by it. It is unique because of uh, you know, the trauma it carries with us for the people. And above all, the world order has changed. We are living in a globalized world where we are interconnected and interrelated uh, more than ever or interdependent more than ever. And we cannot afford to, you know, shut down our doors for long or shut down our borders for long for other nations. So what options do we have? Uh, a plausible option that uh, my study I have I have you know uh, found in my study is multilateral diplomacy and luckily we have it working. Uh, I may take this example of uh, COVID uh, Covax pillar, Covax pillar that is uh, uh, a pioneer project by Gavi, a unit of uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation which is a public-private partnership and uh, uh, it has you know, funding from the government, the foundation or the private uh, corporations and individuals. So Co uh, COVAX Pillar is, a, uh, we can say a flagship project that we have in the present time uh, that, that is a ray of hope uh, because all uh, governments are under pressure to provide vaccine to its population and it is not possible for a single nation to uh, you know produce that uh, amount of uh, vaccine that can be uh, used by uh, forget about the in, in, uh, friendly countries or the other world even its own population i doubt i mean immediately it cannot be made available so through multilateral uh, diplomacy through multilateral vaccine diplomacy, we uh, may have a solution or a ray of hope or a light in this uh, tunnel. So I would like to speak a little more about the COVAX pillar. It is based on the principle of pooling of resources uh, by the participant nation. And uh, the basic idea is uh, to speed up uh, the vaccine making because uh, we cannot wait until the vaccine is made or tested or tried, and then we manufacture for the people. So uh, what they are doing is they are financially backing the most uh, uh, promising vaccine that we have, vaccine trials or vaccine under making, we can say that we have. They are financially backing. And uh, another important or beautiful uh, you know, concept with this COVAX pillar is equitable distribution of uh, vaccine. That was you know, highlighted by the first speaker, uh, how we are going to you know, have uh, vaccine for everyone. So uh, this through this equitable distribution of vaccine, uh, this scheme is like uh, you know, insurance policy for the rich nations. They may have 
uh, the bilateral, uh, you know, collaborations with any pharmaceutical country, but this is like a parallel uh, option for them. And uh, in return, what they have is they have assurance that whenever the vaccine will be made, they will have it. The 20% of population will have it maybe by the end of 2021 if we are successful in getting a vaccine by the end of this year. And for the poor or uh, you know underdeveloped nations, uh, they will also be part of this. They will also be beneficiary of this even if they are unable to purchase or pay for the vaccine. So this is the beauty of this uh, COVAX pillar. And uh, a few submissions that I would like to make uh, during my study, what I found, uh, coronavirus pandemic has made us realize that human predicament are shared. We, we all go down to this uh, crisis. And uh, this shared problem needs shared answer. We cannot, you know, uh, compartmentalize based on maybe uh, a hypernational idea or regional idea or any other preference. Second, uh, another observation is uh, state actors alone are failing to find solutions to, you know, uh, contemporary issues. Uh, we have seen in the beginning of this virus, uh, coronavirus crisis that how uh, developed nations or how the leadership in the developed nations or, or the Western nations reacted to this pandemic from all the conspiracy theory to hoax and how, uh, how things unraveled in course of time. So state actors do not have that uh, you know, uh, commitment or willpower to fight with crisis like this. And here comes the role of non-state actors, which is very important for us. And they have larger share, greater role to play uh, as we are seeing in the case of uh, COVAX pillar. It's a classic example uh, where I believe for the first time in the human history, a non-state actors has pulled uh, almost 172 uh, nations together to find out solution of uh, this crisis. And they are working on uh, this. Another observation or submission is what we have now is every nation uh, is engaged in some kind of, you know, war. Uh, it could be proxy war or it could be direct war and coming from India, I, I, I have uh, witnessed you know, the past uh, few months uh, were not easy for us, be it with China or Nepal or other neighbor, neighboring countries. So uh, we need to, you know, step forward. We need to step forward uh, from that competing or combating um, approach or attitude towards uh, maybe our neighbors or the other powers or other stakeholders involved. And we need to have more collaborative and co-optive uh, diplomacy or approach towards problem uh, solving that we are having right now. And uh, we need to be prepared as, uh, uh, as somebody has said that we are entering the age of pandemic and we had four epidemic in the last two decades. So uh, it's now or never for us, if we are not ready to know, collaborate at multilateral uh, lateral fronts, it will be very difficult for, uh, uh, for the humanity to sustain. And at last, uh, I would like to say, it is very important to you know, believe in science. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sonali. Uh, is, are there any questions? Does anybody want to ask Sonali? You have a question, Bhavaskar? Not exactly. No, okay. No. So, uh, can I ask you a question, uh, Dr. Sonali? Sure. Uh, this is uh, regarding the availability of the vaccine. There are uh, conflicting reports, and from the people that I spoke to in the pharma industry, they said uh, that it will not actually be available for equitable distribution, at least to the general population, until 2022. Okay, so, and by then, I believe, apparently, we will develop herd immunity. So if there is any information that you have on this, 
uh, can uh, tell us something more? Because then, you know, the uh, utility of the vaccine is lost as such. Probably a new right. pandemic will arise by then and we will have to develop another vaccine. So uh, how do you see the situation? Right. Uh, thank you, Chair, for your question. Uh, what I found in my study that uh, the COVAX pillar plays a major role in this. And uh, through the equitable distribution, their commitment is first for the most vulnerable population. Uh, so they are committed to provide the vaccine first to the healthcare professionals and to the old age people and to the people who have uh, chronic disease. So this is the you know uh, trick behind this uh, commitment, and of course you are right. If uh, we are late in uh, making the vaccine available, we will have the herd immunity by you know uh, 2022. So it will be lost. But if we get succeeded, we will have uh, you know the 2021 a hopeful year for uh, like most of us. Yeah, that's it. That I can say for now. Thank you. I think uh, with that, we have come to the end of this uh, session because uh, one of uh, the speakers is not there. So, uh, if, uh, if anybody doesn't have any questions, can we just wind up this uh, session? Can I have one question for Dr. Anna? Yes, for sure. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Anna, um, uh, your uh, thesis was your presentation was about humanitarian diplomacy foreign policy goals and public diplomacy i already asked you some question but uh, uh, can you how do you see russia position after this pandemic where do you see russia will it be uh, one of the leading powers because it has developed the vaccine early and it is involved in so much of humanitarian work among the underdeveloped countries do you think that uh, it'll be playing a very uh, crucial role in international relations in the post-COVID world order? However you look at it, in whatever way uh, you perceive it, we just uh, want to have your views on that. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Saraswati, for raising this question. You mean uh, in various spheres, uh, what yes. role played Not by Russia? In, uh, in, in any field, the way you look at uh, how Russia can position itself after the pandemic, the post-COVID world order, uh, from the point of view of, say, uh, uh, humanitarian help that it has given to various mm -hmm. countries and mm -hmm. the distribution of vaccines also can be used as a point mm -hmm. of reference. But you can uh, express uh, and give us your view uh, from any point of view that you think of it. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I suppose that uh, in the international arena, Russia positions itself as a country that uh, provides a stable world uh, order and Russians are always appealing towards justice. That uh, it's what about uh, Dostoevsky was always writing about uh, these are our universal uh, values and happiness of the whole mankind. And uh, for sure, Russia counters legalistic, moralistic approach that we were predicting that all these humanitarian uh, interventions would lead uh, towards uh, humanitarian disasters. And now when we are witnessing that now there are about 80 million displaced people that uh, our human uh, history has never witnessed it but you know uh, during the international studies association conventions i was always attending the uh, john mersheimer's lectures and sessions with him and now i've heard him uh, thanks to nepal international association cooperation association and uh, during uh, his presentation uh, he was again mentioning this point that for sure russia has global uh, ambitions and maybe it has in enough resources but uh, for sure our weak uh, economy is a great uh, obstacle for it so much more could be done in the sphere in order to ensure our possible role in the post covid world order Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Velikaya. Yeah, so you. I would like to thank all the panelists. Uh, can, uh, can, I, I, no, no, can I have a small question? Do yes, we have please. time? Yes. Yeah, uh, my question is about, uh, very recently there was a debate about the 
vaccine nationalism, which is where uh, we find people. Who are you addressing your question to? Uh, uh, I'm addressing the all three panelists because these three are represented in different countries and yeah. they, uh, they, the issue like. Angrolli has raised her hand. Yeah, the, the issue is like, like uh, uh, vaccine nationalism, and there was a big uh, essay published in Foreign Policy uh, Journal. So the countries are fighting, you know, fighting in the sense that there is a competition, we can say, to develop vaccine uh, for this coronavirus. So how this, uh, some, some scholars are arguing, <clears throat> this, uh, this is uh, the emerging trend of uh, uh, vaccine nationalism. So how this vaccine nationalism, how you people as, as a scholar, Percept or see this uh, vaccine nationalism and how it will appear to the geopolitics of the Asia or of the world. Any, I mean, this Maybe, question. Uh, to... We can uh, address this question to uh, Switcher. Yeah? Okay. Because she raised her hand. Okay. Are you there? Are you there? Switcher? Yeah? Okay. Switcher yeah was there just now. Yeah, I'm not yourself. I'm not yourself, please. Switch up. Switch yes, Angrolia. Angrolia. Yeah, you just animate yourself first. Myself. Okay, no, no, switch. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, now do it. Why? You know? Okay, now do it. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, I raised my hand to add to your question because I want to hear from uh, perhaps Madam Chair and also um, our, our esteemed panelists. I was very uh, this was exactly the question I had in my mind, and I'm not an international relations expert, so I'm not in a position to answer this. I have a cause for concern. Um, metaphorically, Nepal is a country with great civilization. We are strong in our own aspects, but in a lot of ways as a landlocked country, uh, we are not in a position. I, I am concerned for my government to have a, a, a stand to reject some countries. Like I, I, that's the kind of thing I'm thinking. Does Nepal have the temerity to reject some countries if they feel, even though they are big, they, that may not be in our best interest or they may not play by the ethical rules? Uh, number one and number, and, and number two, uh, that that is definitely a big question that I have, and it's it's a cause for concern. And I echo the sentiments of Dr. Sonali. I definitely uh, believe the hopefulness. I will definitely share the hopefulness that you have talked about. But I'm just trying to play the devil's advocate here and talk about um, the lessons from the past that we may not have learned as well. Um, so that is a that is a question. I, I'm just worried that Nepal may not be in a position. Uh, due to a number of other geopolitical reasons to even say no to a country or if they say yes to a certain country, what kind of other pressures will, will it have to endure in the, in the days to come? And we don't know how much uh, a lot of information is in, in the public domain. So it might be, uh, there might be a lot of struggle as big powers compete uh, with their vaccines and uh, jostle for uh, power. We may have an issue uh, despite my optimism, I have a concern about countries like uh, Nepal. Yeah, that, that's a question, but <laughs> unfortunately, I don't have an answer to your question, but I would love to hear from my panelists. And, and Sonali, Dr. Sonali. Yeah. Yes. So thank you. Uh, that was a wonderful question and a big no to, uh, you know, vaccine nationalism, the debate you were talking about. If I speak in principle but of course in reality this may happen and it is happening there is you know race or competition among nations to come uh, first with a vaccine it will also add to uh, the soft power advantage of that nation as in case of Russia but again it's little controversial uh, we can put it aside but uh, there is you know if we talk about uh, the world order it is guided by uh, the liberal institutionalism sometimes, or we are talking about what Fred Delmeyer has said, post-liberal uh, society, where we talk about uh, recovering from our past and working for, for a shared future. But still, I do believe that realism uh, play an important role. What uh, Sreksha said, that power is uh, important and 
although non-state actors have evolved and played a greater role, state actors uh, have not come out from their cell that, shell that they are not that significant anymore. So it is like uh, living in their own dreamland and it will be destructive for all of us. So if I talk in principle, there should be multilateral cooperation. And if we promote this uh, vaccine nationalism, we will end up having you know, another conflict, another uh, problem. So it will be like a vicious circle. And this is not going to end with uh, this pandemic itself. We have other shared issues that we need uh, you know, uh, to resolve, like uh, the global warming or uh, terrorism or nuclear non-proliferation. Uh, uh, we need to address those things. So uh, this is an opportunity. Corona pandemic is an opportunity for us to uh, just reflect what we have done in the past and to learn that how we can just move forward and how can we can work together uh, for a better and shared future. But will that happen in reality or not is a big question. But uh, I would just uh, close my remarks with a hopeful note that hopefully it will. Madam, unmute yourself, ma'am. Unmute yourself. Yes. Host muted you. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay, there is a question that come from uh, Absalu Rahman to everyone. What is the role of WHO? in the auditing of pharmaceutical companies experiment of vaccine in developing countries like Nepal. So who uh, would like to answer this? Do we have time for this question? Um, I can try to answer yeah. that question. So, uh, you can see the question, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. So this is an interesting question. I, I noted as regards Nepal, the WHO has not uh, made comments at this point about they leave it to the sovereign right of states to whether allow proposals from different countries uh, on vaccines. So they, uh, WHO uh, in this regard is not able to uh, have, a, have a definitive say. Of course, uh, once the, when the clinical trials are taking place, it is left to the jurisdiction of countries and their national laws and their national ethic bodies to say yes or no to vaccine proposals. So the problem is really in, in terms of uh, geopolitical realities, whether, whether Nepal is actually in a position to even say, you know, uh, XYZ company, you don't meet the ethical requirements and legal requirements of Nepal, uh, but uh, are, are we able to say that keeping in mind other considerations? And of course, in countries like Nepal also have a pressure developing countries under sustainable development goals, human rights obligations to try to, to, try to make it seem like they're trying hard and, and seem credible in the eyes of the public that they are doing something. So in, in light of these utilitarian and efficiency-based uh, considerations and good publicity, governments want to stay in power. So this is a great opportunity for them to say, look, we've just invited three stakeholders to carry out vaccine trials in Nepal. So a, a whole bunch of extra legal considerations uh, take, that, take place, but the WHO will not really interfere in Nepal's sovereign right to accept or reject, if, if we even have that power to reject, uh, is, would be my answer, yes. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. So we all do know about the limitations of the role of who, and I think, uh, uh, Mr. Rahman, uh, you're aware that uh, the, with these limitations, uh, the who has is still the only body that can speak uh, globally and set standards. So let us, uh, hope that uh, the uh, who's, uh, those countries that abide by the who, uh, which most countries are abiding by the who, uh, will uh, be careful about the way in which they develop the vaccine and ensure that it's available to all uh, very soon. So can we conclude our section with that? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to make any concluding remark? Uh, the, I have been making his remarks, so I think. <laughs> okay, so uh, Sri Lakshmi, Close to you now. Sri Lakshmi. 
Yeah, yeah, sir. I'm audible. Yes. Okay. So distributed uh, chair speakers, ladies and gentlemen, as we came to the end of this section, I deme it a great honor to propose a vote of thanks on the behalf of INNCE and WPC to all our gratitude us with our presence and contributed their part to make even a resounding su success. First of all, all we would like to express our profuse gratitude and sincerity thanks to Dr. Saraswati Unni for agreeing to chair and moderate the section today. Uh, our sincere thanks also go to all our speakers for being a part of the event and uh, delivering such a uh, comprehensive and convincing presentation. We all are honored. So thank you for all of you coming here. Please join us for next session. Thank you. We are on the next session. As it will be on 1745. So still uh, one more hour. Thank you. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, you ma'am. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So Rao, so Rao Sahib, now you can have the lunch if you have not had it. <laughs> you have one hour break. It's, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's five. It's lunch, buffer or dinner. I don't know. You know, it's like uh, the world, you say, we say good morning, good afternoon, good evening. So it's like, breakfast for someone. Sorry for the interruption. Sorry? Yeah. So sorry yes, for the interruption, but I, have, uh, but I have one question to Sonali, ma'am. Yeah. Good. Ask. Uh, sure. Please ask. Uh, Ma'am, as you told that uh, you're studying on uh, recent current epidemic, so I have one question regarding this. Uh, nowadays, the pandemic is going up and up. So, uh, and uh, in recent news only, I came to know that a vaccine has been come in the Oxford University, but still it is getting, uh, what do you say? Human trial? Uh, researching. Uh, in process. In yeah, process, yeah, yeah. I mean, not, I meant not to market it. In process. It is in the process. So, uh, everyone, uh, even each of uh, one child also asking that when we will have our own, uh, that uh, previous life. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Sri Lakshmi, for your question. So I'm basically a student of political science and for my PhD, I have worked on public diplomacy and vaccine diplomacy is something that I started studying very recently and this paper is in uh, no progress so of course uh, like everyone we talked about i'm also curious when we will be back to the normal and i'm sorry to say there won't be the same normal that we Thank had you, before you know yeah there won't be that same normal uh, because everything has changed you must have seen you no know, in our daily life uh, we are having mask while uh, social distancing and self quarantine. These are the terms that everyone is talking about uh, in the recent uh, five to six months. So I believe the same normal uh, will not come back. And as the conference uh, theme is about the new normal, the new normal will be different. We have to be, you know, more cautious, more um, more careful. And as I talked during my presentation, we need to be more cooperative and collaborative, more empathetic, more you know caring towards each other rather than uh, just you know uh, targeting in all those uh, ruthless behavior, be it uh, towards uh, individuals or nations or towards anyone. So the normal that you're talking about, sadly, I feel that will not come back. It will come back but in another form we have to you know just adapt to the new novel am i uh, like uh, did i answer your question yeah yeah ma thank you i'm sorry may i have one comment if i may 
Please. Yes, go ahead. Yes, I just like to say that although currently motives of national egoism and national interest prevail, but I suppose that as Dr. Singh was mentioning about Cold War, Smorodiv Sabin cooperation in polio eradication, that uh, I, I hope that science diplomacy would come to our aid and maybe there will be some cooperation of doctors of independent medical associations so some ethnic standards would be launched and uh, I hope in the, that science diplomacy would help us in the sphere of medicine and in the sphere of international relations to better understand uh, each other. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely, I totally agree with you. What we need is you know, more uh, health education or medical literacy uh, for our citizens and a greater uh, policy umbrella Maybe in our education system, we need to prepare our children to be ready for such pandemics in future. So for that, science diplomacy is going to play a major role. Mm 